His name is Jehoshaphat. What a name. And it's an amazing time because he gains the respect of other people because he loves the Lord. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery, a program taking you through the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. It's a great time through the Bible, 34 years. And we're going to talk about this in about four minutes time. So stay there as we look at 2 Chronicles chapter 17. Corey is here with Ryan. Corey? Well, the Bible paints for us a really vivid picture of a moment in time of the lives of Jehoshaphat and Ahab. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. Ryan? What does it mean to be a friend of God? Well, it's a really important question, and it's something that we're going to try and answer on today's program. Very good. Excellent. Janice, what are you going to do? Go into all the world. All right. Take your Bible guide out. If you don't have one, don't worry. We'll tell you how you can get one in just a moment. Let's turn our mind towards the most important book of all, the Bible, and listen to God. Second Chronicles 17, 1 through 12. Then Jehoshaphat his son reigned in his place and strengthened himself against Israel. And he placed troops in all the fortified cities of Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim which Asa his father had taken. Now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the former ways of his father David. He did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not according to the acts of Israel. Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand, and all Judah gave presents to Jehoshaphat, and he had riches and honor in abundance. And his heart took delight in the ways of the Lord, Moreover, he removed the high places and wooden images from Judah. Also, in the third year of his reign, he sent his leaders Ben-Hael, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nethanel, and Micaiah to teach in the cities of Judah. And with them, he sent Levites, Shemaiah, Nethaniah, Zebediah, Asiel, Shemiramoth, Jehonathan, Adonijah, Tobijah, and Tobionijah, the Levites, and with them Elishama and Jehoram, the priests. So they taught in Judah, and had the book of the law of the Lord with them. They went throughout all the cities of Judah and taught the people. And the fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms of the lands that were around Judah, so that they did not make war against Jehoshaphat. Also, some of the Philistines brought Jehoshaphat presents and silver as tribute, and the Arabians brought him flocks, 7,700 rams and 7,700 male goats. So Jehoshaphat became increasingly powerful, and he built fortresses and storage cities in Judah. Second Chronicles chapter 17, verses 1 through 12. You know, it's interesting as we continue on through the history, we see kings rise and fall. Um, and this is really something because this is really a thousand years of history as we focus on this. Um, it, it was under a thousand years the kings came in but it's important. And we run into these kings, and as we look at this, Jehoshaphat is one of them. And Jehoshaphat was the son and the fourth king of Judah. Now, the nation south to Israel is Judah. And the Bible says that Jehoshaphat not only did well in the sight of the Lord, but that he delighted in the way of God and restored the knowledge of the Word of God back to the people. In our reading today is Second Chronicles 17, we learn that Jehoshaphat sent some of his leaders, as well as some Levites throughout Judah, to teach the people from the book of the law, the law of the Lord. Israel and Judah, and they all had a difficult relationship throughout that time. And at this time, and Jehoshaphat's time, he was determined he was going to restore that relationship. 
Well, the problem was that the kingdom to the north was evil with Ahab and the queen Jezebel as the queen at the helm. Jehoshaphat was so blinded by his renewal effort that he was willing to befriend the ally of Judah with the wicked idolatrous king of the nation of North Israel, Ahab and Jezebel. And that becomes a problem. Now, hey, listen, Jehoshaphat was a great king, but let's keep in mind that we want to do good things. The problem is that you can't do good things when the Bible tells you don't follow other gods. And in the north, they were seeking after other gods. There comes a point when you can't really make that peace with God when you're trying to be friends with everybody who's worshiping other gods. It becomes a problem. Well, uh, take your Bible guide and turn to today's passage. If you don't have one, write to us or call us. And we'll send you one. Just remember, it cost us a little bit to send it to you. So keep that in mind. Also, uh, go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. That's our website. And you can click on the Bible Guide. When you do, it'll take you to a donate page. Thank you so much for your donations. They help us. They keep us alive. So thank you for that. And uh, it, it takes you to a place where you can actually download it exactly how we printed it. I mean, it's just the same. It's in an electric copy. This is very important for people overseas. Anyway, uh, as we read through the Bible, let's pray. And Father, I pray today, as I look at these words from 2 Chronicles chapter 17, verses 1 through 11, help us to hear what you're saying. Because Lord, this it's not important what I say, but it's important that you speak. Help us to do that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's look at this. 17 verse 1, then Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place and strengthened himself against Israel. And he placed troops in all the fortified cities of Judah. And he set garrisons in the land of Judah, in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa, his father, had taken. Now the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the former ways of his father David. You see, he did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not in according to the acts of Israel to the north. Therefore, the Lord established the kingdom in his hand and all of Judah gave presents to Jehoshaphat. And he had riches and honor in abundance and his heart took delight in the ways of God. Moreover, he removed the high places and the wooden images from Judah. That brings me to an interesting thought. Jehoshaphat was well respected and rewarded by God for his obedience. Now listen carefully, beloved. We are rewarded for our obedience to Christ. What is a reward of God? A reward of God is not multiple, you know, millions of views on social media. That's not what. A reward from God is peace, love and joy and solid relationships and ability. That's the reward of God. So we need to keep that focused. We need to understand that. And as we read on, we understand that Jehoshaphat was rewarded by God. Now, now listen to this, this because this is really interesting. Verse 7. Also the third year of his reign... He sent leaders, Ben-Hale, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nathaniel, and Micaiah, to teach the cities of Judah. And with them he sent Levites, Shemiah, Nathaniah, Zebediah, Ashael, Shemariah, Jonathiah, Adajaniah, Tobajiah, and Tebedajiah, the Levites, and with them Elashemiah and Jehoram, the priest. So they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them. They went through all the cities of Judah and taught the people. Remember, Jehoshaphat sent men and Levites to teach the people from the book of the law. That is critical, beloved. So the church of God is built upon those 
who know and love the word of God. Bottom line. That's it right there. We have to know and love the word of God. You know, if you're in a church that loves the Bible, they're teaching it on Sunday, but they have Bible studies in the week. That's important to do. We need to keep the word of God front and center, especially today, because God will reward us if we do. Now, there's two verses here that get really interesting. And as we focus on this, I want to pay attention carefully. Verse 10 says, And the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord fell on the, now look at this, fell on the kingdoms of the lands that were around Judah, so that they did not make war against Jehoshaphat. Look at verse 10. The fear of the Lord fell on the kingdoms of the land that were around Judah, so they did not make war against Jehoshaphat. Look at verse 11. Also, some of the Philistines brought Jehoshaphat presents. Really? And silver as a tribute. And the Arabians brought him flocks and 7,700 rams and 7,700 male goats. So Jehoshaphat became increasingly powerful and he built a fortress and storage cities in Judah. Jehoshaphat's reputation for loving God became his protection, praise God. The Lord protects those who love and worship him. If we love and worship the Lord, he protects us. I don't know how it works, except that God does what he says and says what he does. His word tells us. The word of God, this is what I say. When we read the word of God, we see it. And let me tell you something. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's true today. The more we love God, the more he protects us and helps us in this time. Beloved, we need to pray. Father, help us today to love you and make you a priority in our lives. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ today that we would not be sidetracked by our own ideas, but we would be directed by your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come into our hearts, come into our life today and teach us your way and show us your path as we look at Zechariah and learn about the future. Help us to hear what you're saying in the name of Jesus Christ. And we said together, amen and amen. All right, well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study. And my segment today is called My Friend, My Beloved. And it's inspired from passages like 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7. And in this verse, Abraham is called the friend of God. Similarly, the Apostle John is also referred to as the disciple who Jesus loved. And tradition says that he was known as the beloved disciple. Well, what does it mean to be a friend of God or to be beloved of him? Well, let's explore that a little bit. Abraham has many titles in scripture, but perhaps the most notable and significant is friend of God, a title by which he's called no less than three times in the Bible. These include 2 Chronicles chapter 20 verse 7, Isaiah chapter 41 verse 8, and in the New Testament, James chapter 2 verse 23. It is interesting then that Hebron, which is one of the main places Abraham lived and where he was buried, is a Hebrew name which means friend. In fact, even when the Arabs later took it over, they renamed it to its Arabic name, El Halil, meaning the friend. According to the scriptures, being a friend of God is no small thing. In fact, part of the close friendship relationship is disclosure of the future. This can be seen in Genesis chapter 18, where God and two angels pay Abraham a visit. Privately, God asks the angels a rhetorical question. Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? The obvious answer was no. Another instance where God disclosed the future to Abraham is through the offering up of Isaac in Genesis chapter 22. Indeed, some have supposed that Abraham wanted to know how it was that God would bless all the families of the earth through his seed, as promised in Genesis chapter 12. Thus, it is conjectured that our Lord designed a way to teach him, through an experience, what he had already communicated to him in words. 
he was given a prefiguration or a type of the sacrifice that the last in the line of the seed, that is Christ, would accomplish. At the very least, Abraham knew he was acting out a prophecy because he named that place Jehovah Jireh, meaning in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. This concept of disclosure being linked to friendship with God is also consistent into the New Testament. Jesus declares to his disciples in John chapter 15 verse 15, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. One step beyond being a friend of God is to be beloved of God, and there are only two people in the entire Bible who are given such a title. The first is the Old Testament prophet Daniel, who is called beloved three times in his book. And the second is the New Testament disciple John the Apostle, who is famously known as the beloved disciple. It is of no insignificance or coincidence, then, that Daniel and John are the two greatest sources of prophetic revelation in the Bible, Daniel with his book and John with Revelation. Because of their faithfulness and obedience, God disclosed revelation to them, not given to any others. Thus we observe not only a consistency between the Old and New Testaments, but also, and more importantly, within the nature of God. You know, what excites me the most about this is that you and I as followers of Jesus Christ are also considered the friends of God. And if you're in doubt about that, then I want to remind you that he also disclosed the future to us. He's done it through his word, the Bible. And if you're truly a believer and you take his word seriously, then you understand that God has graciously laid out his plans for the future in the Bible. You know, I wonder what would happen if people truly understood, I mean truly understood, that the Bible is the very word of God and actually revealed to us his plans for the future. Well, I suspect that this least read bestseller would quickly become the most read bestseller. I think it's important to remember that because uh, if people truly understood the Bible as God speaking to them, they would definitely pay attention mm -hmm. to it. More people would talk about it. Our program wouldn't be so unique as we go through the Bible. You know, that's what we do. People say to me all the time, all you do is go through the Bible. I say, yes, all I do is go through the Bible. I wish I had more time to go through the Bible. Uh, but it's really important, the Word of God, because it speaks God to us. That was very good, Ryan. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right, Corey. Okay. Second Chronicles chapter 18. What an interesting chapter. You know, we often get details in the lives of the kings, but we're not often told the setting and the scenery and the like a, a clear word picture of what they were seeing and what they were doing at the time when these events happened. I mean, sometimes it happens, but not always. So here in Second Chronicles chapter 18 is one of those times where we are let in and a window is open for us to kind of the setting of what's going on. Okay, so Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, good king, loves God's trying to follow God, downfall, he makes a marriage alliance with Ahab, as in Ahab and Jezebel, famously evil king and queen of Northern Israel. Jeho Jehoshaphat's probably trying to make things better because there's been historic wars going on between Israel and Judah. Nevertheless, Jehoshaphat, after several years, goes up to Samaria, the capital city of Ahab, and after a big fest, all the festivities to welcome Jehoshaphat uh, to Samaria, Ahab asks him to go to war with him. Like, please help me out in this war against Ramoth Gilead. And Jehoshaphat's like, okay, well, we, we have to ask a prophet. I, I want to hear from God on this. So jumping down to verse nine, I want to read to you the picture that the Bible paints for us. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones, arrayed in their robes, and they were sitting at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets were prophesying before them. And we're told earlier that it's 400 prophets. So there's a lot of people in an area. So they're sitting at the gate. There's an open area in the gate of the city of Samaria, apparently big enough for 400 people, big enough to be used as a threshing floor. Now threshing is the last part of uh, collecting 
uh, wheat from the grain harvest, right? They would throw it up in the air, the wind would carry it away, they would separate the grains from the chaff. Now, bring in our director, pop up on the screen for me the first image here. Now, this is the, uh, the city of Dan, so it is not the city of Samaria, but this is a ninth, ninth century gate complex that was most likely built by Ahab himself. Now, kind of ignore the tree and the beautiful stones that are around it, because that wouldn't have been there. But see in the center of the frame, do you see that little podium, that little platform? Platform. It has uh, like little stone pe carved pedestals around it. Uh, that is believed to have been a podium that would have held a throne for a king or a judge, maybe even an idol to sit on and then the king when he was visiting. So we can imagine that in his capital city, Ahab probably would have had a larger platform that he and Jehoshaphat would have sat on and the prophets would have been prophesying in front of them in a larger area than we see here at the city of Dan. Okay, so that just kind of gives us a, a little bit of um, a little bit of an idea. Oh, actually, Brandon, pop up that second picture for me because the uh, archaeologist in charge of Dan actually reconstructed it. Those pedestal stones on the side are believed to have held up a canopy, which makes sense, right? It's hot. You want to have you you, you want to have cover from the from the sun and, and the elements. So um, the king likely would have sat underneath. There would have been a beautiful tapestry or curtain or something over the top of that. Um, maybe maybe plants as well, we don't know, uh, but something to be used as a covering. So you can imagine Jehoshaphat and Ahab sitting on a larger platform in all their stately glory. They're wearing their royal robes that everyone knows this, even if they've never seen them before, right? That must be Ahab and that must be Jehoshaphat. Okay. Now, of course, all the prophets are like, yeah, it's going to be great. Go for it. But there's one prophet that Jehoshaphat's like, no, there's got to be a prophet of Yahweh. There's got to be a prophet of God. Bring him in. And it's really interesting because I think this is why the Bible explains this setting to us, because this is what Micaiah, um, Micaiah says. Second, he says this. This is the second thing he says. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. Isn't that interesting? The Bible's painted us a picture of exactly what Ahab and Jehoshaphat were doing in their stately glory sitting on their thrones. But the real prophet says, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab, king of Israel, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead. And I think Ahab's um, response is interesting. I don't believe this guy. Put him in prison. He's just lying. He's lying. But I'm also going to I'm going to go in disguise to the battle, just in case, just in case. But he learns the age-old lesson you can't hide from God. Yeah, exactly. Disguise. And yet God, you know, we know the outplay of this. And God, I mean, he gets killed. Yeah, he gets he gets killed in battle. Micaiah's prophecy is, is true. Yeah. Happens. But it, I, I love the throne room, like the throne setting and then the throne setting of God. Very interesting. And stuff. isn't it interesting with Ahab? I don't like that guy. Yeah. He, doesn't, he doesn't say what I like. He's I the like worst. the other prophets here. You know, I wonder why Jehoshaphat Ahab. Like, right? and, but, you know, we kind of cherry pick sometimes. We do. What we like to hear and what we don't want to hear and, and kind of avoid sections. We can't do that. Can we? No, we can't do that. Now, go into all the world is what I titled my segment here today. Um, we're going to go back a little bit in history. Right now, we're in Second Chronicles 17, focused on that. But an important um, part of David's original plan in assigning duties to the Levites was a delegation of teachers throughout the country. We can see that in First Chronicles 26, 29 to 32. But that became impossible once the kingdom was divided. But what we see here with Jehoshaphat is that he brought this idea back and designated certain Levites as traveling or itinerant teachers. And they carried copies of the law and instructed everyone in Judah how to live as God's people. And we see the results of that in verse 10. It says, And the fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms of the lands that were around Judah, so that they did not make war against Jehoshaphat. And and I thought, you know, Corey, that kind of bears reminding of what you're talking about mm -hmm. here as well and what we were saying about what we hear, what we don't want to hear. And we need to understand that 
these teachers, these Levites that were sent out by Jehoshaphat and earlier by David, they didn't just go and preach their own whims. Yeah. They didn't just go out and deliver what they thought that everybody wanted to hear or what was going on in the culture. They took the book of the law with them and they had to understand it. And so often as we are studying the word of God and as we go to Bible studies together or do this program, we're actually learning as we go along mm-hmm. because we're, we are having to, to, to focus on this word and and Ryan you can challenge us and the viewers with different things that you have seen Corey you can challenge us and the viewers with cultural things and 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 getting a little bit more in depth and reading between the lines and pulling out things that we wouldn't see culturally and and we we all can work together with the scriptures here and I and I just thought it how interesting that that Jehoshaphat did this and that is the way that that the word of God that his laws and the way to live as God's people was spread mm. Jesus said Mark 16 15 go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature that's not instructing us to just go and and say what we think and what we feel and and the favorite portions of scripture or our own interpretations but to go out with God's Holy Spirit and with God's Word, the Bible, as the authority in our lives. Not our authority, but God's authority. And what is it that you say when we read the scripture and you pray? It's important for us to listen to God. We have to be a better listener than we have to be a talker. That's important. It's very interesting. We've done uh, six sermons for you from Zechariah. It's a great prophet, messianic prophet. He's awesome. And you can get a hold of those sermons if you go to our website, BibleDiscoveryTV.com, or you can call us or write to us, and we'll tell you more about how to do that. But today we need to pray, Father, Heavenly Father, Father in heaven, we thank you for victory that we have over sin through the death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the resurrection. Amen.